I am oh, and I am pleased to uh, to be here today as a co-host um, for our webinar that's titled "Reimagining the Role of Immigration in Nova Scotia's Continuing Care System." Um, so it's a real pleasure and an honor um, to be able to work uh, closely with. Um, the uh, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, Nova Scotia, and their team um, on, um, on, on bringing a conversation uh, to, to, or bringing people together in conversation around um, the important issue of immigration and continuing care. Um, so uh, before getting started, I'd like to just um, open with a land acknowledgement, um, and then as some housekeeping, I will, um, I'll be serving as your moderator, so I will introduce the different speakers, um, and, um, and we have a number of excellent presenters who are joining us this, this afternoon. Um, we would like to save some time at the end to hear from all of you that, um, uh, that are also with us, so, so thank you. Um, so I respectfully acknowledge that the land on which I am a guest today and from which this webinar is hosted is the traditional, ancestral and unceded land of the Lenin people of the Mi'kma'ki territory. I acknowledge that people of African descent have been in Nova Scotia for over 400 years, and I honor and offer gratitude to those two communities who came before us to this land. As an uninvited settler to these lands, these acknowledgements remind me of my responsibility to actively contribute towards reconciliation with responsibility uh, to actively um, and also um, you know, be thinking about what's happening within our communities um, and, uh, and addressing issues with humility. Um, and so I'd like to invite everyone who's in the audience today, as well as our speakers, to reflect on their own relations to the land um, from which we meet tonight. Um, and uh, even though this meeting is facilitated by Zoom, we are all joining from somewhere. So please feel free and welcome to post your own acknowledgments in the chat. Um, and so now I'd like to introduce uh, Catherine Bryan. Um, so uh, Catherine Bryan is an anthropologist and assistant professor at Dalhousie University School of Social Work. Her work focuses primarily on social reproduction, migration, and livelihoods uh, through the lens of feminist political economy. More precisely, she draws on qualitative and ethnographic methods to explore the historic, uh, transnational, and relational origins of migration pathways, uh, connecting precarious labor markets in rural Canada to the Philippines, uh, Mexico, and Jamaica. She has published on transnational mothering, hospitality as commodified care, and histories of Filipino care labor migration. Catherine teaches in the areas of social policy, social theory, and research. Um, thank you, Katie and uh, Mary Jean. Uh, thank you to the panelists and everyone joining us today. Um, I will momentarily have children crashing into the house, so my apologies if I suddenly become distracted. Um, they're, they're all just returning home. Um, so as Katie said, my name is Catherine Bryan. I'm an anthropologist and an assistant professor at Dalhousie School of Social Work. Um, I'm also the chair of the CCPANS's Research Advisory Committee. So the Nova Scotia office of the CCPA opened its doors in 1999 to provide greater balance to public policy in the province and to show that there are options in public policy, even in a context increasingly determined by the pressures of globalized neoliberalism. Through our work, um, we promote a participatory and accountable approach to public policy development, and we propose policy alternatives that aim to move us closer to achieving a more economically and socially just, as well as environmentally sustainable province and Atlantic region. In 2021, we produced five publications covering issues important to Nova Scotians, including the updated living wage in Nova Scotia, the 2021 report card on child and family poverty in Nova Scotia, and the housing for all report, which brought together 40 plus community researchers, frontline supports and activists to produce 95 recommendations concerning affordable, accessible housing for all in Nova Scotia. 
We are proudly funded by Nova Scotian donors, and it is because of them and because of all of you that we are able to do the work that we do, um, including today's panel. So before turning to our panelists, uh, Katie has asked me to offer a few opening remarks to frame our discussion. And so thank you again, Katie, for, for this opportunity. Um, in Nova Scotia, as elsewhere in Canada, the onset of the coronavirus pandemic in early 2020 exacerbated existing and generated new anxieties concerning access to food, other supplies, and essential services like care. These anxieties prompted a recognition of the essential quality of the labor required of, simply put, things like cooking, cleaning, and caring, such that workers, historically vulnerable and underpaid across these sectors, were celebrated as heroes. This fed into modest initiatives on the part of government and industry intended to ensure ongoing access to their labor. The state's intervention into employment sectors it had previously abandoned to capital, coupled with the reversal of policy initiatives intended to redress the imbalance of power between employers and labor in those sectors, reveals the pervasive unwillingness to formally recognize what we might broadly refer to as reproductive work as vital to both economy and society. The framing of these workers as essential yet exploitable has proliferated amongst advocates, activists, and academic researchers who highlight the profound tension between the need for care, the systems uh, we have in place to access it, and the fundamental lack of value assigned to those who provide it. Though perhaps accelerated under COVID, what is critical for our discussion today is that this is in many ways the prevailing feature of capitalist societies, that those responsible for the work of survival are rendered vulnerable and in turn exploitable despite their essential quality. Of particular importance again for our discussion, these sectors are increasingly dominated by migrants and newcomers across a range of legal statuses and are often racialized and frequently gendered in anticipated ways. Importantly then, for the migrant workers in Nova Scotia whose experiences will be highlighted today, the essential quality of their labor did not mitigate their vulnerability to exploitation, in contrast, coupled with the oftentimes precarious, um, with their oftentimes precarious legal status, it exposed them to greater risk and levels of vulnerability, allowing for the ongoing profitability of for-profit care and under-resourced public care. At the center of this, we encounter the longstanding collaboration of state and capital and the creation of untenable social and economic conditions, and in turn, social policy solutions that prioritize the interests of capital. Immigration policy, as we'll hear, is no different. It is a highly flexible and adaptive mechanism through which the objectives of capitalist political economy vis-a-vis -vis its own reproduction and the reproduction of labor are predicated. In Nova Scotia, it intersects with vulnerabilities already endemic in the care sector, enabling higher levels of productivity and profit relative to what would otherwise be achievable with local labor insofar as legal status remains a viable mechanism of labor market stratification in a social context ostensibly invested in equity. And so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Katie, um, who will serve as our discussion moderator and who will introduce our speakers. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, so uh, I'm pleased to introduce our, our first speakers, uh, Mary Jean Handy and Shiva Norpana. Um, Mary Jean is a community engaged researcher and activist who has been studying care work and care policy in the context of globalization and social transformation for more than 10 years. Academically trained in adult education and community uh, development at University of Toronto, her research focuses on aging, immigration, precarious work and continuing care systems. Uh, she is currently a senior researcher with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, Nova Scotia, and a postdoctoral fellow with the Nova Scotia Center on Aging at Mount St. Vincent University. She also leads a SHRC Insight Development Grant um, with Migrant um, Manitoba, exploring the policy landscape and experiences of immigrant home care workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Uh, Shiva is a first generation immigrant from Iran who made the beautiful province of Nova Scotia her home in 2008. Uh, she works for the province and prior to that, she worked for a community organization, the Transition House Association of Nova Scotia uh, for three years. She also teaches at the Department of International Development Studies part-time at St. Mary's University in Halifax. She holds a PhD in social anthropology from Dalhousie University and a social sciences and humanities research council postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Guelph. She has been a board member of Halifax Refugee Clinic, a nonprofit organization offering pro bono legal and settlement services to refugees in the region since 2011. Um, so welcome Mary Jean and Shiva. Thank you, Katie. I'm going to get my slides up here. Okay, everyone can see? Okay, so thanks for the introduction. Um, Shiva and I are going to just hit some of the key points in our uh, putting continuity and continuing care report that was just published yesterday uh, in this presentation. So um, what is the current context in Nova Scotia in terms of continuing care and immigration? The crisis level staffing shortages are all over the media, so I don't need to review that. Um, the focus has understandably been on the urgent need to recruit large numbers of workers, um, but the retention plans are hazy and the growing reliance on newcomers to shore up the direct care workforce has received little attention in the media. These shortages are intensified by the pandemic, but they're longstanding, and the need for direct care workers, also known as continuing care assistants or CCAs, is particularly acute. The province is aiming to hire 2,000 new CCAs in the next couple of years and increase staffing ratios in long-term care homes to support four hours of direct care per resident per day. However, the current um, currently there are formal, there are no formal commitments to increase wages or improve working conditions beyond having more staff. Uh, international recruitment efforts have ramped up. Refugee and migrant healthcare workers are relied on heavily during the pandemic but condition, their conditions of work are uh, continue to be poor and pathways to permanent residency or PR continue to be overly complex and restrictive. Uh, so largely the retention issues, which are longstanding are not being addressed. Uh, retention rates of CCAs and immigrant workers in Nova Scotia are not encouraging. Uh, uh, while the new new immigration programs in Nova Scotia have increased foreign recruitment, the most recently calculated five year immigrant retention rate for Nova Scotia is 65%, which is the lowest in the country outside of the Atlantic region. Researchers have pointed to issues such as lack of secure jobs, comparatively low pay, minimal benefits and settlement supports as contributing factors in this low retention. CCA retention issues in Canada are also widespread. A recent study in Ontario reported that around 50% of CCAs, uh, also known as um, personal support workers, leave their jobs within five years. Burnout and the availability of jobs with better pay and better working conditions elsewhere are central reasons for leaving the sector. And the Nova Scotia needs to address these issues if we're going to improve the healthcare system and, and provide stable, good quality care. And so just a note on, on CCAs and who they are what, and what they do, they're, they're frontline um, care workers and they engage in skilled relational work around um, supporting long-term care residents and home care users with essential daily activities such as bathing and toileting. Uh, despite this essential work, they're notoriously precarious, unregulated, underpaid um, in almost all jurisdictions in Canada. They receive uh, the lowest pay among healthcare workers, averaging less than $18 an hour in Nova Scotia, which is lower than the wage for CCAs in other Canadian jurisdictions and below the recently calculated living wage uh, for Nova Scotia regions. Uh, there's also a wage penalty incurred by racialized migrant care workers. Um, they're more likely uh, to be paid less than their native born counterparts, um, and they are more likely to engage in in uh, precarious low status, low wage care jobs, such as casual positions um, in home care, as opposed to unionized positions in acute care. 
Um, there's multiple immigration programs prioritizing CCA recruitment right now. Most are provincially organized, um, but uh, there's also some federal channels which are going to be discussed in more detail today. Um, and each program has its own set of requirements and restrictions, so I won't go into detail. Um, but the important piece is that the pathways to permanent residency continue to be um, complex and, and difficult for, for workers to navigate. And, and just before I switch over to, to Shiva, um, just a quick note on why we emphasize uh, PR status or permanent resident status so much in this report. And, and today, PR status is the legal right to permanently reside in Canada. Without it, newcomers have restricted rights, access, restricted access to jobs and healthcare, and face the threat of deportation if they lose that status and can't access PR, or lose their temporary status and, and can't access PR. So I'm going to pass it off to, to Shiva now. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie, Catherine, uh, Mary Jean, for the introduction and for providing the space for Mary Jean and I to present the research, the report and the research that we've been working on for the uh, past few months. Um, there are a couple of things that I just wanted to note before, uh, uh, before handing it over. Uh, but uh, first of all, um, I wanted to talk about not a lot of what we're talking about, not all of it, and I'll talk about like the essential things, but a lot of what we're talking about, it, it's com it was completely predictable. It was not new, like the, the shortage that we're talking about, the turnover rates, all the things that we've listed here on the, on the, on the slide as re re regarding the critique of current, Im current immigration policies. Uh, this has been extensively researched, extensively documented way before the pandemic. This nothing is happening. The, the, the crisis, and, and I'm using quotation marks just to indicate how manufactured it is and how entirely preventable it could have been with regards to healthcare staff and staffing with regards to the application processes. Uh, I myself, as a PhD student, when I started in 2012, have been writing about and researching, and it, and it goes back to way before the divide between temporary, the differential treatment between temporary and permanent residents, which Mary Jean, uh, which Mary Jean talked about. This has been an issue of concern to scholars, to activists, who have talked about, you know, the the vulnerability to abuse, the potential for labor abuse and other other types, human rights abuses for term for temporary migrants, precisely because of their precarious temporary status and their dependency on employers. This has all been extensively documented and talked about, and it's out there, like so many other things that, you know, and we can just take them off one by one, homelessness, violence against women, domestic violence, uh, unpaid labor, and all. it's been there, but the pandemic has really magnified it. So, uh, all, I, I'm not going to read through the list, but these are issues that have been uh, bugging and, you know, uh, uh, marking an immigration policy, which otherwise, and, you know, just for a moment to remember, Canada's immigration policy globally is a stellar immigration policy. So I don't want to think about what's going on in other countries, but these are critiques that have been going on and the pandemic has really put a spotlight on you know how uh, on these kind of failure points. So, Mary Jean, sorry if you can uh, just move on to the. So I mentioned before that I mentioned that a lot of the uh, these issues have been ongoing, historic. What has not been ongoing, and what is uh, you know really to use an overused word, unprecedented. <laughs> Uh, in this kind of landscape of labor and migration and asylum seeking is in fact uh, what, what you know, really caught my attention as a refugee scholar, really caught the attention of Halifax Refugee Clinic. I know uh, they're in there in the audience. Shout out to Julian. Of course, we have a staff member here uh, from Halifax Refugee Clinic who will be talking more about it. But this channel, so what we see that is very unprecedented for, for us and something that we hadn't encountered before 
was a federal pathway, as they call it, pathway to permanent residence for failed or pending refugee claimants to access permanent residence. And I want to emphasize just how unique and unprecedented, again, <laughs> this pathway is because there exists a very strong, again, very well documented, a uh, very well respected, I can say, international refugee protection regime with the 1951 Convention on the Rights of Refugee as its cornerstone, with, you know, decades of legislative and scholarly work setting out the rights of refugees, the conditions under which they may, they may apply for refugee status, and none of that has to do with labor. Right now, uh, as far as I understand, UNHCR, the United Nations Agency on uh, Refugee Affairs, uh, encourages states to recognize the rights of refugees for labor. However, the status of refugee to up uh, to become a sex uh, to be have your status as a refugee recognized by a state has absolutely nothing to do with the type of work that you're able to perform. So, in that sense, this uh, federal pathway and this policy is really unique in the refugee discourse in the sense that it's tying together a very specific form of migration status, a very interesting form of migration status. You know, everybody's interested in refugees and what they're doing and how they show up and where they're coming and so on. Very interesting form of migration status with a very specific type of care. And uh, I think uh, Gab uh, Gabriella will be talking about the very specific nuances of the care, the body work that is required. So this is, again, something which has caught the attention of scholars. It's, uh, there is critique about it as always, because it is considered that it uh, removes the burden of protection from states. It's presented, uh, I think Catherine earlier talked about the kind of heroic language the, during the pandemic, certainly during the earlier phases of the pandemic, we saw that we talked with the governments and you know the public started talking about healthcare workers. We see it a lot in regards to this particular pathway. There is a government policy which talks them, about them as guardian angels. It's a very uh, loaded emotive language which is being used to talk about them. Uh, it's. It's a welcome development from what we've seen before, prior to the pandemic in years before, where you know we saw the refugees as a burden, as queue jumpers, line jumpers, seeking handouts, all sorts of absolutely divisive, toxic nonsense, I might as well say that, about refugees and asylum seekers and the kind of conditions in which they show up. So in that sense, this is better, but at the same time, it is what is known in the scholarly discourse very econocentric as it reward as it rewards a very specific type of labor, very specific type of economic contribution to Canadian society. And it's a complete like 180 departure from the spirit of like the 19 and the word of the 1951 convention on the protection of refugee rights so uh in what we are presenting today we're not arguing that it should be uh you know that refugees shouldn't be that's not the, the shouldn't be using this pathway or and anyway it's I, I understand that it was for a very limited amount of time anyway but to be aware that there is a lot of debate and a very a fair amount of caution regarding uh, how it may be, how it you know can unfold and how what kind of precedent it sets. Um, I think we're done with this slide, Mary Jane. Oh, and I actually talked about this slide too. So I think I'm almost up with my, so yeah, the, where um, the, the, this idea of the policy being a very econocentric one, which uh, casts refugees as economic uh, resources to a society, rather than highlighting the protection responsibilities, the international and human humanitarian responsibilities of states towards refugees who find themselves in their territory, the, emphasize, the emphasis is purely on their economic contributions of a very, very specific type. Uh, so I'm actually going to stop talking here and turn it over to the next speaker. I'm, I'm hoping I haven't gone over time. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mike.
Thanks, Shiva. So I'll just wrap up a bit about, um, you know, some of the key points in our report. Um, I just this the last slide here, I just wanted to emphasize, you know, uh, something that Pat Armstrong has famously argued, the conditions of work are the conditions of care and good quality continuing care supports um, require uh, strong relationships that are based on continuity, familiarity, predictability and respect. And unfortunately, newcomer CCA or CCAs are mired in both precarious immigration status and precarious jobs that undermine not only their well being, but their ability to provide that good quality care. Um, in Nova Scotia in the long term. And just a, a couple of other points, you know, workplace health and public health are the same thing in a pandemic. And we really need to, we need to treat workplace health as public health. Lack of continuity characterized by this kind of revolving door of precarious workers juggling multiple and often dangerous jobs also undermines our ability to limit the spread of COVID-19 and, and really save people's lives. And PR again, and all of the security and access to essential services it provides workers is not just a nice to have. It's, it's essential for the well-being and safety of workers, as well as the older and disabled people they care for. And it needs to be embedded in the province's uh, recruitment and retention plans. So there's a, um, you can go to the CCPA uh, website um, for more information about the report and some of the other things that um, we have going on, including how to donate and, and such. And I'll wrap up there. And I'm very excited to hear from uh, our next speaker. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Mary Jean and Shiva. You've given us quite a lot to think about. Um, and we will uh, have time again for discussion. We'll save it till the end. Uh, so our next speaker is Prince Osu. Um, so Prince is a PhD candidate at uh, Carleton University School of Social Work. He has worked as a research assistant and trainee on several research projects, including uh, reimagining long-term residential care and international study of promising practices and seniors adding life to years or salty uh, currently he is working with me <laughs> uh, as a research assistant on equity diversity inclusion and accessibility at the maritime sport uh, support unit or mssu um, and uh, prince is happy to share his preliminary research findings from his dissertation with supervised by dr susan bradley on the experiences of racialized care workers in rural and small town canadian long-term residential care facilities uh, so prince's dissertation draws data from a sub study under the salty project um, which uh, it, there's a oh, it's a multi streamed project and so uh, the stream that prince is drawing from is um, uh, focusing on mapping care relationships um, and focuses on data sets from alberta ontario nova scotia and british columbia um, so thank you prince thanks katie and uh, thanks for the introduction that saves me some of the uh, work that I wanted to present. Thanks to the organizers of the webinar as well. So uh, just going to present uh, some of my preliminary findings as uh, Katie has noted here. And I just want to focus more on Nova Scotian data, but uh, before I do so, I just want to acknowledge that uh, because I, I take a look at this study from a feminist political economy uh, perspective, I acknowledge that context matters and that there were some differences across the different research uh, sites as in, in different provinces. However, the similarities were much more resounding and stronger than the differences. And these contexts that uh, are rural and small town were obdurately white in terms of the values, the culture, the sights, the sounds, the smell. And, and these uh, differences or these contextual differences were very, very different from the experiences of racialized care immigrants. And as a racialized person, when I entered those spaces, I could uh, sense the differences as well. And I, I talk about utilizing myself as instrument in my own study. So the findings for this uh, from the study revealed that racialized care workers worked under uh, precarious conditions in long-term residential care in rural and small towns. Across all research sites, it was evident that racialized care workers worked some of the most challenging shifts and were frequently relied on by managers to fill uh, shifts when 
there was a shortage of staff. Racialized care workers were willing to work these sh uh, shifts. And uh, as uh, Daffy has uh, utilized in her own study, in some ways coerced uh, because of their social location, uh, certification requirements, and also their immigration status. So as I mentioned before, I would be focusing on the Nova Scotia uh, data set. And that revealed that there were acute shortages of, uh, long, uh, of workers in long-term care. And also there was, related to the acute shortages, there was a casualization of long-term re residential care labor. Workers talked about working precariously across multiple sites and they worked also full-time hours and even sometimes more than full-time hours employed at, as casuals lacking essential benefits. Corroborating the studies of Banerjee et al., Delhi et al., and Bradley et al., the study also found that uh, racialized care workers experience violence on the job and the specific types of violence uh, that the uh, racialized care workers uh, talked about was uh, physical violence, being hit, being hit, their hands being squeezed, and these usually went unreported. Verbal violence, which is uh, which included uh, overt racism, and then maybe if we have time for discussion, I might uh, share some of uh, the, the phrases I learned with you. And they also talked about structural violence, which in itself is linked to uh, the poor working conditions, uh, such as acute shortages, not having enough people, not having enough time, and not having uh, control over the work that they did. Also, they talked about uh, audio certification processes. Bear in mind that some of these workers were RNs in their uh, home countries. And when they moved here, they had to descale and try to gain certification, Canadian certification, in order to work in levels commensurate with the levels that they, they, they were employed at in their home countries. Some of them descaled temporarily as they strived, but some over time just gave up because of the audio, uh, audio certification requirements. There was also covert racism. And we also found that when uh, racialized immigrant care workers uh, moved up uh, the ladder in terms of uh, their progression, so if they moved from uh, CCA level to uh, LPN or licensed practitioner level or to RN, there was some tension among workers and, and I could explain more of that later as well. They also talked about uh, cultural shock and isolation and cultural shock, particularly because they, they felt uh, uh, very surprised when uh, families did, did not uh, pay close attention to palliative residents when they were at uh, their later stages of, of, of life. And, they were very isolated in those rural contexts because there were very few of them and they did not have respites to communities uh, outside uh, the work where they can uh, sort of re revive themselves and relive and just, uh, just, just sort of practice self-care in ways that they can uh, uh, gain back what they were investing in the care process. And I, I talk about precarity a lot in my work, but I also always want to emphasize the agency and the resilience of these workers. So despite laboring under poor conditions and exploitative conditions, these workers were very resilient. They exercised their resiliency by caring more even under these conditions. And you would say it is counterproductive and, and, and it is perhaps, uh, it gives more room for exploitation, but also care itself is a process of resistance. So that's what they did. Also in, 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 in my work, I found that they resisted by inviting more workers or some of their friends from Ontario and other parts of the country into Nova Scotia to work with them. And this helped them maintain a presence and, and help them have friends on the job rather than working in total isolation. And when that happened, I, I learned from them that they 
use their humor, for instance, to deal with the overt racism on the job. They also uh, strategically moved to Nova Scotia, most of them from Ontario, uh, moved to Nova Scotia because they wanted to access permanent residency. At that time, the uh, Atlantic uh, Immigration Pilot Program was very popular and they used its life that to secure permanent residency for themselves and for their families as well. And so in the interest of time, I will conclude here. And as I conclude, I just want to uh, make a few points here. Racialized care workers continue to play a huge role in long-term residential care. Expectedly, as other uh, panelists have mentioned, there is a renewed interest in recruiting immigrant uh, care workers as we continue to navigate the uncertainties of the COVID-19 pandemic. For instance, there is now uh, the federal program international mobility program that allows uh, employers to hire temporary workers without a labor market impact assessment. But immigrant care workers is not the entire solution. There is the need to focus on improving working conditions as uh, uh, Mary Jane mentioned, and to address the structural and historical inequities in the system. As uh, Shiva also noted, Improving long-term care is about building a just and humane, humane and equitable society where the most vulnerable uh, can live their, the latter stages of their lives with dignity, respect, and a sense of joy. So what could happen or what might uh, achieving that look like? For me, I believe that it would entail employing a stable work Force with the right staffing mix and right skill levels and numbers also uh, on board. These are not new. Improving uh, time to care hours and, and, and placing more value on care work and compensating workers adequately. Investing also into training and education and utilizing IDEA or inclusion diversity equity and accessibility policies and practices that allow racialized care workers as well as other minority groups to be had, providing adequate support and mentorship programs for racialized care workers, and being intentional about creating and nurturing teamwork and collegiality among workers, and also celebrating the cultures of racialized people. I, I went to several homes and there was I, there was nothing in, in board meetings with the uh, 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 leaders and, and owners of the home. There was nothing mentioned about racialized care workers, but see nothing about their culture represented until I actually met them. And, and there is the need to shift from that position moving forward. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Prince. Um, I loved what you said when you, you talked about care itself as a process of resistance. And I think that's really important, especially as we're working to make sense of, um, you know, these very exploitative and violent structures, as you said, but also to, to think with what, what could agency and resilience mean? So thank you. Um, so I'm pleased now to uh, introduce our, our next presenter. Uh, so, um, Gabriela Gutierrez uh, Sandoval uh, is an immigration lawyer currently practicing in Nova Scotia at the Halifax Refugee Clinic. Uh, Gabriela obtained her civil law and common law degrees uh, at McGill University. She was called to the bar in Ontario in June 2018 and then in Nova Scotia in January 2021. So uh, in Toronto, she worked at private firms and assisted clients in various areas of Canadian immigration, including corporate and personal immigration matters, such as work and temporary resident permits, applications for permanent residents on humanitarian humanitarian grounds, uh, family sponsorship applications, admissibility matters, and appeals before the IRB and federal court. 
So at the Halifax Refugee Clinic, a nonprofit which provides free legal and settlement services uh, to refugee claimants and individuals with uh, precarious status, uh, her focus has shifted to refugee claims, uh, pre-removal risk assessments, danger opinion, and detention-related matters, as well as federal court matters. She provides services in Spanish, English, and French. Uh, so welcome, Gabriela. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. Um, I'll be taking you through the clinic's experience um, navigating the public policy for permanent residents, um, specifically for refugee claimants. Um, and so I'll jump right in with a very quick distinction between refugee claimant status and permanent resident status, just to highlight the precarity and stability that attaches to each and I think has been coming out in all, all the presentations so far. Um, so a refugee claimant is someone who is seeking protection in Canada because their life or um, security safety is at risk in their country of citizenship or from a resident. As a refugee claimant, in order to work in Canada, you need to apply for a work permit. If you want to study, you need to apply for a study permit. If you want to study, you pay international student fees. Um, and you do have health coverage, but it's under a federal program. It's not access to provincial health, um, like MSI in Nova Scotia. As a permanent resident, um, you have a lot more stability apart from citizenship. Um, you don't need a work permit to work. You don't need a study permit. You can pay domestic rates. You can um, ask for student loans from the federal and provincial governments, um, and you have access to provincial health care. So the purpose of the temporary public policy that um, Shiva and Mary Jane mentioned um, was to facilitate the granting of permanent residence for certain refugee claimants in the healthcare sector, not all of them. Um, so something to note is that the program itself was launched in December 2020 and it closed in August 2021. So it was very short lived and very discretionary. It's not a permanent part of the Immigration Act. It was a discretionary program that opened up for a limited amount of time. In terms of eligibility, um, I would say the main factors that applied in this um, process was uh, revolved around while well, your immigration status, your job position duties, the hours worked, and it also involved strict timelines. Um, so in terms of immigration status, the applicant had to be a refugee claimant or a failed refugee claimant with an appeal pending, and their claim had to have been made before March 2020. So any refugee claimant that launched their claim after that time and worked in the healthcare sector in these occupations wouldn't have qualified. They needed to have a duly um, authorized work experience in predetermined categories. And this came up in one of the slides. I don't know if we, we don't have to pull it up, but basically there were six categories, um, six designated occupations, um, which included, for example, nursing, supervisors, registered nurses. Oh, perfect, thanks. Um, I think it's slide 11. Yep, there we go. Licensed practical nurses, nurse aides or orderlies, home support workers. So I've highlighted two because those were the two under which most of our clients were um, able to apply. And I think what I wanted to just highlight as well is that um, it, you know, not only was it such a narrow category or narrow set of categories, really only two of them were realistic for several of our clients. Something else to note about these categories is that despite their titles, there were intentional exclusions of certain kinds of workers. So our most uh, popular common um, not code that we used with our clients was 4412 home support workers, housekeepers and related occupations. But if you go to the next slide, you'll see that actually home support, um, sorry, housekeepers were specifically excluded from this um, program. And it, if you go to the next slide, just to drive that point home, the guidelines indicated that, you know, if in your care role, you did provide, um, perform housekeeping duties, that couldn't have been your main role. So they just really want to make sure that we understand, you know, if you're applying under this category, only if you're a home support worker, if you're a housekeeper or other related occupations, you don't qualify. Self-employed caregivers also didn't qualify. Um, something else to note is that 
applicants in this um, program had to demonstrate that they were providing direct care to patients. So either working in private long-term care centers, hospitals, assisted living facilities, um, and they needed to show that they were providing um, daily consistent um, assistance, whether that was administering bedside care, personal hygiene, um, collecting specimens, helping to um, administer medication, they, companionship with them and family, they had to show that they were in constant contact, regular contact with the um, clients. In terms of hours, uh, so there were two sets of minimums that our applicants had to meet. One was the 120 hour minimum that they needed to show that they performed work between March and August, 2020, 120 hours or equivalent to four, four, time, four weeks of full-time work. In addition to that minimum, they had to show that they had worked six months in total in this healthcare sector in this specific occupation with a valid work permit. So something that I'll note um, in, when I speak shortly about the pros and cons was that actually we had many um, consultations or we had several consultations where people met the maybe six month minimum where they could show they worked for you know six months or more in many cases, but they didn't meet the 120 minimum between March and August 2020, which was an arbitrary number. We, we don't know why they decided four weeks was sufficient or why specifically 120. It was just a criteria that if you met it, you met it. If you didn't, you didn't. So in terms of the pros and cons, um, I would, I'll start with the positive aspects of this program, and that's that it provided a faster route of permanent residence to a lot of our refugee claimants. Um, we began submitting applications for clients in January 2021 and began to receive approvals in February, which was uh, unheard of in the immigration world for refugee files. Um, and, and there's a two-step process to approve a file. First, you are, have to meet the eligibility criteria, and then there's a second set of checks, background checks that they have to do to make sure that you're not inadmissible to Canada. So we started receiving the first stage approval letters fairly quickly, and we had a lot of our clients beginning to have that process come to an end or be landed is what the term we use in the fall and even up now into winter 2022. So the processing time was eight to 10 months. Um, and that again is pretty, pretty quick turnaround in the immigration world. Um, the refugee route by comparison can take much longer. You have someone file a claim, they can wait several years to get a hearing, two years, four years even. And then after they have a claim and it's successful, uh, they're hearing and it's successful, then they can apply for PR and that takes another one to two years to process. And if there's family abroad, that takes another, uh, the, the, the time lengthens. So it was a positive aspect for many of our clients who were successful under this public policy because they just received PR in a year almost or less and wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't have had that same opportunity through the refugee stream. The other positive aspect is that um, these refugee claimants didn't, um, didn't have to or avoided the emotional and psychological drain, psychologically draining aspects of a hearing and having to prepare to speak about some of the most traumatic moments in your life and the ongoing harm to you and to your family who may still be abroad and may still be in hiding. So for a lot of the uh, clients that we assisted under this program, it, it really helped um, relieve them of that, that anguish of having to tell their story and prepare to have someone judge and decide whether they're deserving of protection or not. In terms of the challenges we encountered with this program, well, the first is that it was a discretionary program. So it was, it's not, again, it's not part of our permanent immigration framework and it was short lived. So it ended in August. And as we know, there have been several new waves produced by COVID and, and some variants have had more severe consequences. Um, and there have been refugee claimants working in the health sector, but they are not, uh, they do not have the same opportunity to apply because they didn't, well, the program is closed and they wouldn't have worked within the um, timelines that would have made you able to qualify. Um, in terms of the occupation categories, uh, they were fairly limited. Um, again, out of the six listed, only two were feasible for our clients. And even then, most of our clients applied under the, the last category, home support workers. 
Um, and I think this might bring up maybe a bit more discussion around what, you know, how we value work and how we label it in the immigration sphere. We, you know, value what we call high skilled labor versus low skilled. And, and then, of, of course, if anything, the, the pandemic has shown us that what we label low skilled work is actually very essential and should be recognized. And we had very difficult conversations with certain clients and with clients or consultations, um, people outside the organization that called to see whether you know they were eligible. And um, there were some very difficult conversations we had to have because there were people who were working very long hours, very difficult shifts um, as security guards, for example, in a psychiatric ward or maybe a housekeeper, uh, housekeeping at a hospital. And they didn't qualify for this program. And um, one particular call left an impression on me because the um, that individual felt so humiliated, you know, having you know been working for so long in the health sector and and doing some very precarious work, terrible hours, and um, not having that work valued and not being able to be part of this uh, process was was for her very demoralizing. Um, so. I think to us, it highlighted how narrow this framework was and how exclusionary and how it could have, you know, you could expand the categories. Um, but it, you know, it's something that I think if this program is renewed, they can consider other types of occupations that are still within the healthcare sector or other sectors where there is frontline work and it's just as essential, even if it's not providing uh, bedside care and companionship. Um, the hours as well were very strict. Um, we had a situation where a, a client didn't didn't uh, qualify because they were five hours short, and these five hours were hours that were um, the person had received training. And so, when there was contact back and forth with immigration to determine, you know, well, you know, could there be some flexibility because this training is part of employment? It's considered employment. It's paid. Um, and the response was, it's it's not, you have to be providing direct care. You have to show that in those 120 hours, you're providing direct care to patients and that training didn't include that. So that person didn't qualify and they did meet, they went above and beyond with the six month minimum and were just five hours short of that 120. So they weren't able to apply for that program. And the final challenge for many of our clients is that in the refugee stream, if you are successful and then you apply for permanent residence, you can include your family who are abroad, certain family members like spouses and children in your PR application and everyone is processed together. With this program, only the applicants who were in Canada were eligible to be processed. So we had situations where we have, uh, where we had mothers, for example, here who, um, had children abroad and had to decide whether they were going to go through this PR process, knowing that it could take a year, could take more, because at that point, we didn't know how long this program would take to process. Meanwhile, they had a child in their country um, of residence or former citizenship, and that child may age out during that processing time. Because in immigration, there's a lot of different sets of definitions and, and limitations and eligibility. So if a child is 22 and up, they are no longer considered a dependent. Um, and so in this, in this process, she would have had to get her PR and then sponsor the eldest child if she was still 22 and under, or stick to the refugee stream where if you are successful, at that point, you can still bring that child even if they're above the age of 22 because there's more flexibility under the refugee stream for that family reunification aspect. So these were sort of the types of questions that we had to discuss and put to our clients and ultimately make a decision about. So in brief, the program is, it was novel and I think it was um, a, a good intent, uh, attempt to recognize care work uh, provided by refugee claimants. Um, but there were several barriers in the actual process that disqualified many who worked in the care sector and were exposed to COVID, and, but whose work unfortunately wasn't sufficiently valuable. So moving forward, maybe um, in terms of policy activism, um, I think what would be things to consider about this, a program like this is making it renewable and not so temporary. 
Um, so reopening the program, expanding the occupation categories, um, the care roles that we consider eligible, and being more flexible about how we calculate those hours, because it seems unfair that, you know, someone's worked a year or more multiple jobs in the care sector, but because they didn't work 120 hours between a specific um, designated framework, they don't qualify. It, it, so those are just um, a few insights that I hope can highlight and make it pr provide a realistic um, perspective of how this is affecting clients in the immigration process. Um, and thank you again to all the speakers. I, I find that uh, the different perspectives you all brought have enlightened me a lot. So thanks again. Great, thank you so much, uh, Gabriella. And I mean, those questions around how work is valued and how lives are valued by extension and also what's treated as essential are so critical. And with that, um, we have time now for questions. So there's about 30 minutes remaining. Um, what we would like to do is open the floor. So just have some open discussion and really hear from uh, those of you who jo have joined us today. We also have a few structured questions that we'd like to pose at the end just as a way to conclude and wrap up. Um, if you don't get to ask a question or if there's something that occurs to you later, we do hope that you will um, reach out and perhaps um, Lauren, if you wouldn't mind sharing any uh, information or maybe Mary Jean about your, uh, uh, your contact uh, email, um, if folks have questions related to the, uh, to the panel, we can uh, create an opportunity for them to touch base with the presenters. 